Thank you, Bob. And uh, it's a great opportunity to share with you what's happening in 2015. That's my disclosure. I have contract research with a couple of companies. And our learning objective is to learn about a CDK4-6 inhibitor in ER-positive breast cancer and look at TDM1 and neurotinib in HER2-positive breast cancer and finally look at the androgen receptor and its target therapy in triple-negative breast cancer. So for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, the endocrine therapy has found, formed its foundation. What can we do better to improve our patient's survival? The major challenge is the endocrine resistance. You all have the experience when patient was placed on androgen receptor, uh, ER um, uh, inhibitory therapy such as tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor, after a while, patient will progress. So it's identified that estrogen receptor uh, breast, positive breast cancer depends on the cycling D1, which is a direct transcriptional target of the estrogen receptor. Upon the activation of cycling D1, it further activates CDK4-6 and causes downstream phosphorylation of um, RB, ret retinoblastoma protein, uncoupling with E2F. So E2F got released, and downstream transcription eventually causes G1S transitioning and pushes cell into the next cycle. So the principle has been demonstrated in the in vitro setting. Palbociclib, which is one of the current only approved by FDA CDK4-6 inhibitor, it inhibits the luminal estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cell lines in the red box and has no activity for the yellow box, which is a non-luminal cancer lack of intact RB. And this was further demonstrated by the first randomized open label phase two trial, which is comparing Palpocyclib, which is orally, three weeks on, one week off, plus letrozole, comparing with letrozole alone. The median progression-free survival was 20 months versus the control arm, which is letrozole, 10 months. And the if suppression effect was durable, and this led to the accelerated FDA approval of this drug in February 2015. So now we have approximately six months of experiencing uh, using this drug in the clinical outside of the clinical trial setting. This most recent ASCO, we saw the results update for Paloma 3, which is studying the same drug, but in combination with a different endocrine therapy strategy, which is a estrogen receptor down regulator called Fasildax. And that's a randomized phase two study comparing palbo orally, three weeks on, one week off, plus the injection, which is a full vestrant, versus full vestrant alone. And this is a two to one randomization. An important feature for this study is inclusion of premenopausal women in this trial. You have about 20% of the women who were premenopausal. Um, and the initial Paloma 1 study was only uh, postmenopausal population. So um, he, here you can see the clinical characteristics of both arms, and both arms are heavily pretreated, and patients, um, about 25% are endocrine therapy naive. The rest of them are either getting one to two lines of endocrine treatment, also allow them to have at most one line of chemotherapy. So again, we see a profound, early and profound um, benefit. Progression-free survival is 9.2 months versus 3.8 months, with a hazard ratio of 0.42. So currently, um, again, you see that in the subgroup analysis, there is no subgroup did not derive any benefit. So across all subgroups, the benefit of pulbocyclib was clear. Major side effect, about. Um, 80% of the patient experienced neutropenia. Grade three neutropenia is approximately 50%. So important lesson to learn is check the CBC diff every two weeks for the first three months and monitor the patient carefully. Those reductions are frequently required. So the Paloma 3 conclusion is that it's a practice changing. The second line therapy for ER positive uh, medicine breast cancer and uh, currently, we are starting seeing uh, the use of this in combination with the Fasildax in the clinic. We do need to carefully monitor the patient's count. Moving on to HER2 positive breast cancer, we'll know a little bit about the TDM1 in the neoadjuvant and first line metastatic setting. Also, learn about a new tyrosine kinase inhibitor called neurotinib in the adjuvant setting. 
So this is a very exciting landscape showing the HER2 target therapy. And earlier, Dr. Rosen had uh, mentioned, you know, that the ev evolution of these uh, treatments are phenomenal. From 1980s, we just discovered that ERP2 as oncogenic driver, and now in 2015, we have plethora of agents that is available to be used for the patients. And uh, all the progress being made in breast cancer in the past five to 10 years, mainly in the HER2 positive population. So here are the two agents that are being utilized and being approved. What is the mechanism of action? The TDM1 is a smart drug design. It's a combination of HER2 um, targeted agent trastuzumab with this uh, mitensin, with a linker. So once the antibody is binding to the cell surface, it will get internalized and get, uh, the linker will be break off and the drug will be released. So it inhibits the microtubule polymerization, activates ADCC, inhibits the HER2 shedding. Pertuzumab, on the other hand, works mainly on the in the extracellular domain, it impedes the coupling between the HER family member, HER2 and HER3, and also impedes the coupling between the HER2 themselves. It also activates ADCC. So these two agents has currently been used in the metastatic setting. Now look at the subpopulation of HER2 positive breast cancer. We know that chemotherapy plus anti-HER tar target treatment are very effective you can see that across all these neoadjuvant trials uh, for um, hormone receptor negative disease, HER2 positive breast cancer, we have a very successful complete pathological response rate. Means when you deliver neoadjuvant treatment, by the time the surgeon do the operation, up to about 70 to 78 percent of the patients can have no t cancer detected, so it's theoretically cured. Um, but um, in the HER2-positive population, you see the response rate is much lower. Why is that? And how should we do better for this population? So in this recent ASCO, there is a neoadjuvant trial called ADAPT trial. Study the um, TDM1 in combination with endocrine therapy. Uh, in the neoadjuvant setting. So there's three arms, TDM1 alone every three weeks for four doses, or TDM1 plus endocrine therapy compared with trastuzumab plus endocrine therapy. The primary endpoint reported here is to compare the two TDM1 arm versus the endocrine therapy plus um, the trastuzumab arm. You can, the striking benefit has been observed in the both TDM1 arm, and you can see that endocrine therapy adds minimum to the TDM1 therapy. There's no difference between these two, but there's a striking difference comparing with trastuzumab plus endocrine therapy. So the conclusion from ADAPT trial, TDM1 is very well tolerated. 12 weeks of therapy has a PTR rate of 40% in the ER positive, HER2 positive population. But yet it's not practice changing since TDM1 is not available as a neoadjuvant agent currently. Now put the TDM1 data into the landscape of anti-HER therapy for HER2 positive, ER positive disease. You can see these two, drug, these two arms we just saw earlier is very much comparable with chemotherapy plus HER2 target therapy, but uh, much more effective comparing with endocrine plus HER2 target therapy. So currently, we know that endocrine uh, chemotherapy is an essential part of therapy for the HER2 positive disease. TDM1 could be a less toxic option. Now, can endocrine therapy add to the HER2 target therapy to improve PCR? That definitive question is yet to be answered. Currently, there's an ongoing NSABP B52 trial. Utilize the so-called GOAT standard now as a neoadjuvant agent, which is docetaxel, carboplatinum, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, and adding the endocrine therapy as a comparison. So we'll yet to see the findings. Now, moving on to the metastatic setting. The Marianne trial studies the effect of TDM1 alone, TDM1 plus pertuzumab versus the gold standard, the old ones, which is trastuzumab plus taxanes, either docetaxel or paclitaxel. Primary endpoint being progression-free survival. And surprisingly, um, we do not see any benefit, even for TDM1 plus pertuzumab, is no better than the old gold standard of trastuzumab plus Herceptin. The only difference we observed here is that the health-related quality of life is, seems to be slightly better on the TDM1 arms, and uh, these includes uh, patients, 
uh, self-reported physical well-being, functional well-being, breast cancer subscales. And notably, the trastuzumab plus uh, taxan arm has much higher toxicities. Neutropenia rates about 20%. So conclusion from Marianne trial, docetaxel plus trastuzumab plus pertuzumab remain to be the treatment of choice for the first-line therapy in HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, and TDM1 remain to be the second line of option for HER2-positive breast cancer. Again, this is the guideline remain unchanged in 2015. Now moving on to the novel target agent, what else can, is out down there in the pipeline? There is a narrow, uh, novel oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor called narotinib. It inhibits HER1, 2, and 4. In vivo and in vitro data had demonstrated its efficacy. In the in vitro setting, it's found to be irreversibly binding to the cysteine residue in the ATP binding pocket, comparing with lipotinib, which is binds and leave in a reversible fashion. Also, this drug is known to decrease the HER2 receptor autophosphorylation. In an early phase two trial, comparing single agent neurotinib in patients with either trastuzumab naive versus trastuzumab pretreated population, the single agent activity was quite promising, 56% versus 24%. Now, this adjuvant XNET study utilized neurotinib one year orally. Um, to be delivered after completion of upfront therapy, including surgery, radiation, including the standard HER2 target agents, which we now using, uh, such as TCH, ACTH. But after the completion, patient gets randomized to receive either neurotinib alone for one year versus placebo for one year. And the primary endpoint is to look at the invasive disease-free survival. After two years of follow-up, there has been a pretty promising um, increase and improvement, which is 2.3% in the neurotinib arm. This appears to be statistically significant. Now, the safety data. The drug is toxic. It has 95% of diarrhea rates, and a grade 3 diarrhea rate is 40%. After the implementation of a very aggressive prophylactic agent, uh, antidiuretics such as Imodium, Lomoto, those rates has actually, grade three diarrhea rates significantly drops down. But that's remained to be a very important um, uh, side effect and that we need to pay attention to. There's limitations. The trial has been transitioned from a uh, different study team. It's too early to observe any ob overall survival benefit. It's too early to to draw any uh, firm conclusion. So why this trial in, it, it make us very excited? Because the older data, including the HERA trial, compares two years versus one year of Herceptin treatment, and the ALTO trial, incorporating Lapatnib, older tyrosine kinase inhibitor, into the adjuvant setting. Both studies were negative. The lines are essentially overlapping. So why neurotinib is different? Her, here are the speculations. Neurotinib has salvage activities after progression on trastuzumab. Comparing with lipotinib, the binding seems to be tighter, and uh, the trial design, the sequential use may be more beneficial. So there's many questions to be answered before we can utilize it. Um, how would this data be translated to the current gold standard? We utilize pertuzumab in neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting, so that research is needed. Moving on to triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer is not one disease. It's very heterogeneous based on the gene expression profile. It can at least be subdivided into six subtypes, including basal-like 1, basal-like 2, immune modulatory, mesenchymal, or mesenchymal stem-like, used to be called clotting low. And also the interesting subtype, about 10 to 15 percent, is called luminal AR. These cells are, these uh, subtypes, the highly overexpressing androgen receptor. So this is the future that we are envisioned. We're hoping to subdivide and characterize our patient before we putting on to any 
any uh, therapy, we wanted to treat the basal-like tumor with platinum or PARP inhibitor. We wanted to treat, utilize immunotherapy for the right population. We also wanted to utilize the androgen receptor target therapy for the right patients. And most importantly, and also my own personal research effort, is to study the PIX3CA inhibitors and mTOR inhibitors for the mesenchymal and mesenchymal stem-like triple-negative breast cancer. So um, a current update from ASCO 2015 um, the knowledge of AR-positive um, triple negative breast cancer has been a bit better understood. Has, there's several studies has demonstrated these groups have a better survival, better prognosis, a slower progression, and although currently we don't test androgen receptor as a routine testing, but now since we do have an androgen receptor target therapy, uh, it was a clinical trial, phase two trial, just opened at City of Hope. We are now encouraging our col colleagues to starting checking androgen receptor. And um, in the future, that be, might be something you wanted to look at when you treat your triple negative patient. So it depends on the cutoff being used for IHC testing, either 1% or to 10%. The uh, overexpression can be 10 to 30% of the uh, across all triple negative breast cancer patient. And it's a valid target for breast cancer and prostate cancer. There is an update for phase two trial of enzalutamide, which is the androgen uh, receptor target uh, agent. It, in the prostate cancer population, had a clearly demonstrating benefit. This drug can inhibit the binding of androgens to androgen receptor, can inhibit the androgen receptor nuclear translocation, also inhibits androgen receptor mediated DNA binding. So from one agent from multiple steps can inhibit the AR pathway. So this agent in the triple negative population, about 100 patients uh, conducted by an MSKCC group, they found that the clinical benefit rate at 16 weeks is about 35%. But the response rate is not satisfying. It's only about 6%. Medium progression-free survival only three months. But if they utilize a novel genomic assay called PREDICT AR, they found that this can subdivide the potential patients who may benefit from uh, this agent, the progression-free survival becoming 10 months. So there's a lot more work need to be done in this area. Homolox uh, recombination deficiency, and Dr. Rosen also touched upon this topic. So uh, there is, this is a commercially available assay and uh, may potentially help us to select the patient, select the treatment. So what is HRD score? It measures the three modes of homologous uh, recombination deficiency, including loss of heterozygosity, telomeric uh, aleic imbalance, also large-scale state transitioning. So it's a biomarker that indicates the inability for the cell to repair themselves if there is DNA damage. Potentially, it will reflect the tumor's sensitivity to DNA damaging agents such as platinums or PARP inhibitor. So uh, JEPR-60 is a German trial. They uh, studied this combination of paclitaxel plus mycelate, which is a uh, doxorubicin-like drug, and then adding on top a carboplatinum to see comparing these two different therapies uh, in the triple negative and HER2 positive population in the neoadjuvant setting. Here we're reporting the triple negative results, uh, demonstrating that the carboplatinum definitely is adding um, beneficial, adding increases the, the neoadjuvant pathological complete response rate. But uh, the authors further studied the HRD score and wanted to improve the better rate of predicting whoever exactly um, benefit from this treatment. So comparing the non-HR deficient cells, the PCR rate is only 30%, but if you have the HR deficiency, then the PCR rate is 60, approximately 60%. So again, this can be um, used in the future to select the patient. So our conclusion from triple negative breast cancer, it's a very heterogeneous disease. Currently, there's no effective therapy available, and androgen receptor may be um, a future direction and HRD score may help us to select the patients. Take home message, palbocyclic plus fosfodex in the second line setting significantly prolongs progression free survival. Overall survival data currently is pending and this is a practice changing. TDM1 in the first line metastatic setting is not superior, so our gold standard remains to be the triple combination of docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. 
Androgen receptor is potentially a valid target. A lot more, more work needs to be done for triple negative breast cancer, and HRD score can potentially predict platinum sensitivities. I have three cases. Do I have time? Okay. So first case is 35-year-old premenopausal woman who had a de novo stage 4 ERPR positive HER2 new negative breast cancer with metastasis to bone and mediastinum nodes. She recently progressed on first-line therapy of tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression with a CT scan restaging demonstrating enlarged lymph nodes from 1.5 centimeter to 2.8 centimeter. What is the best treatment recommendation? A, ovarian suppression plus AI. B, pelvocyclic plus facildex. C, single agent capecitabine. D, clinical trial referral. E, ovarian suppression plus AI plus pelvocyclic. I don't have the responding, the, yeah. Does it work? Larry, do we have the, probably not set up, that's okay. Any hand reads A, B, yay, you got it. <laughs> but a referral to clinical trial. We actually have a competing trial, uh, a drug which is Novartis compound. We're having difficulty time in accruing patients because Palbo is out there already. So that's our challenge. Now case number two, 54-year-old postmenopausal woman with previous diagnosis of ER positive 20%, PR positive HER2 negative left-sided breast cancer, infiltrating ductal carcinoma, stage 3B, received surgical resection, adjuvant ACT, radiation therapy. Unfortunately, one and a half years later, she was diagnosed with new liver and breast metastasis. She was triple negative now and androgen receptor was positive, KI67 was 20%. What is the next best treatment option? A, referral for immunotherapy clinical trials. B, androgen receptor target therapy such as anzalutamide. C, referral for AR target therapy trials. D, single agent chemotherapy. E, combination chemotherapy. Answers for A, raise your hand. B, well, anyway, so this is actually a multiple answer question because they all probably can be right in different situations. Um, immunotherapy trial is just being launched. We have a combination of, of aribulin plus Pembro trial just went through IRB and to be open in a couple of weeks. So um, that would definitely be one direction to go because currently we do not understand what is the role of um, anti-PD-1 or anti pd one agents in triple negative breast cancer. I have not touched on today. Actually, among all subtypes of breast cancer, the triple negative breast cancer is probably the most immunogenic. And we do have upcoming uh, pembrolizumab in combination with androgen receptor, uh, excuse me, AI plus um, pelbocyclib which is a PI initiative study, would hopefully will be opening next year in City of Hope to look at the role of adding um, pembrolizumab in the ER positive population. Again, it's a very, very unclear area. Uh, last case, 45-year-old premenopausal woman was newly diagnosed right-sided breast cancer, CT3N1M0, ER positive, her 2 plus positive. Um, actually, it's actually confirmed by FISH. It's HER2 amplified. Initial staging CT did not reveal any metastatic disease. What is the most preferred treatment regimen as a neoadjuvant therapy? A, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, docetaxel, carboplatinum. B, TDM1. C, TDM1 plus pertuzumab. And D, uh, TCH, trastuzumab, docetaxel, and carboplatinum. Answer, A. Yes, you got it. So, gold standard of care. Thank you. Questions? Thanks very much. So, are there any uh, questions in the audience for Dr. Yuan? Yes. Okay. So, I have a question. Um, breast cancer keeps on getting subdivided into 42 different types. And so, how, how do you counsel your patients regarding their various types of breast cancer and what kind of treatments you're recommending and how do you, because it takes a lot longer, I'm guessing, to make a decision with the patient than it did 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, mostly we, we meet them after the surgical consultation. So they understand the difference between 
estrogen receptor positive versus HER2 positive versus a triple negative. That is already being, you know, the concept has been accepted. So then when it comes here, we still need to talk about how biology drives a different treatment. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of these things we just discussed is not yet available in the clinical, regular clinical care setting. But in the clinical trial setting, we need to look at the subpopulation. That's where the field is driving in, in toward to. But currently, uh, we're still based on most of the recommendation, still based on the ERPR and HER2, make, which makes it easier. But in the future, if we, we have to have molecular tumor board, so, which is something much more complicated. Yeah. Does anyone, that's a good question too. Do, just a raise of hands, are there, there was do you one, guys have molecular tumor boards available to you? Can, so we have a few, so that's kind of a new concept that's coming out, and the hands I saw were City of Hope hands, so. Um, but I know there's some national ones, and I know NCC, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network has some online type things too. Go ahead. Hi, I'm a uh, medical oncologist in the Northeast. Um, I have a question. I have so many women who are on either fulvestrin or letrozole for many months or even more than a year with stage four disease doing well. As these new drugs are approved, iBrand specifically, should I be adding that drug to their fulvestrin if they're doing well on fulvestrin alone? Well, this is a terrific question. So we do understand the drug, the side effects are not trivial, and managing them takes a lot of effort. Um, frequent blood draws and the patient's concerns. So I think currently what we are adopting is if the patient's doing well and stable, there's no reason to add them. And I would only add it when they progressed. The, actually, they did a breakdown for PLOMA-3 uh, or PLOMA-1. They look at a subtype, because we all know we have those patients who had a bone-only metastasis that do so good with AI alone for maybe two years. So I think in my mind, I'm still having some reservations to utilize those novel agents, but it's not trivial and it has toxicities, yes. Do you treat uh, HER2-positive T1A disease or adjuvant? Very good question. The current NCCN guidelines do not endorse that. We treat if it's T1B and above, or N1 disease. If it's T1A and zero, not strong evidence. Unless patient is young, there's other high-risk features make you want it to offer benefit. They may consider the denofarber regimen, which is a single agent, paclitaxel plus Herceptin uh, every weekly for 12 weeks. And then you put on maintenance as well? Yes. If it's ER positive. Yeah. Uh, well, if HER2 positive and then uh, you treat with uh, uh, single agent taxane plus Herceptin and then six treatment and then followed by Herceptin. One year. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much, Yuan. Thank you.